Travis, uh, good morning. So you see my uh, title of my talk, Neuroscience Needs a Revolution. And I've come to the conclusion that the, our, the main problem in not understanding consciousness is not philosophy, is not physics, it's really in our neuroscience uh, assumptions. And for example, you can see, uh, do I have a laser pointer? Oh, a, a cursor, can you see that? Okay, good. So you see on the far left, a neuron, uh, I don't know what happened to Kurt. On the far left, the, the, curse, uh, the pyramidal neuron, which is usually thought of as a fundamental unit in neuroscience, uh, and, uh, and consciousness arises from complex interactions. But if we go inside the neuron, we see 12 orders of magnitude of dynamic activity that can be useful. Uh, but in neuroscientific theories, consciousness and cognition emerge from complex computation among simple brain neurons, where each neuron or its firing is considered a bit or a fundamental unit. But, as a, but, the, but, but actually, each neuron is incredibly complex. And not just complex, but, but fundamentally uh, functional. And for example, single cells like paramecium can learn, avoid predators, find food, mates, and have sex without synapses. They use microtubules inside them, which Travis talked about, to sense and navigate. And they may be conscious, we don't really know. Uh, there's two uh, uh, paramecium uh, mating. So maybe they're conscious and, and a pleasure at that point. Um, neurons, our neurons, all of our brain neurons have microtubules inside them which process information. And you can see the networks of microtubules inside a dendrite and on the right, uh, you see a single microtubule that Travis talked about. Do they process information? Yes, they do, actually. For example, uh, inside this dendrite, you can see uh, uh, synaptic plasticity. So materials for synapses along here are synthesized in the cell body and much, must be transported uh, along microtubules carried by these motor proteins, kinesin and dynein, which move along and carry these cargo. And how do they know where to exit, where to depart, uh, take an off-ramp and deliver their cargo to a particular synapse? Might be here, here, they have to turn right or left. Well, they're guided by these proteins called tau, tau proteins, which act like traffic signals and tell them to get off here. Uh, to, d to deliver their cargo for synaptic plasticity, and this is really learning. So the precise placement of the tau protein signals motor proteins to deliver cargo to particular synapses. So memory seems to be encoded in the microtubules, at least in this particular case. And if the microtubules and, uh, uh, disassemble and the tau falls off, or the tau falls off and then which stabilizes the microtubules and, and the microtubules then disassemble, you get Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease, as you know, has the lesions outside uh, uh, the, the beta amyloid plaque, which is uh, where all the money and the research and trillions of dollars have gone to no avail. Uh, you can get rid of the amyloid plaques and the, and the symptoms don't get better at all. And yet the neurofibrillary tangles made up of these tau proteins and the loss of microtubules seem to be the problem. So I think uh, that's uh, uh, something that needs to be redirected. Now, we also know that microtubules have coherent, self-similar resonance patterns uh, every three orders of magnitude. And this, is, uh, this, is, this was, uh, work was done by Anurban Bandyapadye, whom we'll hear, hear from uh, later in the conference, at uh, three different scales. Here's a level of neurons with nanoprobes approaching these neurons. Here's one microtubule here with uh, 10 uh, nanoprobes, and here's a row of tubulins. And in each case, uh, Anurban applied an uh, alternating current and swept the current and found, points, uh, found particular regions of, of highly conductive resonances, which showed up as these triplets of triplets, uh, fr from uh, terahertz to gigahertz to megahertz to kilohertz and then to hertz. So the microtubule seems to be this resonant uh, structure with coherent dynamics every three orders of magnitude. And uh, these occur in uh, hertz, kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, and terahertz. And this is all going on inside every cell, and it may, uh, uh, may allow the paramecium to be so clever, and it may have something to do with our consciousness also. And there's Anurban, and uh, we'll hear from him later in the conference. Um, so these 12 orders of coherent dynamics inside neurons and microtubules are available for information processing. Uh, and if that's the case, the uh, neuroscience of consciousness, which considers each neuron to be a, a yes or a no, a one or a zero, is an insult to neurons, and we need a new approach. We need a new model. Maybe consider the brain not as a computer, but something like a quantum orchestra. Uh, in any case, neuroscience needs a revolution. 
I'm a little bit old to be a rebel, but in this case, uh, I'm trying. So let's go back to what we do know and, and agree upon. Conscious perception involves three waves from thalamus, except for smell, which goes directly into olfactory cortex. So vision goes from the thalamus to the back of the brain, and then in the, in the feed forward uh, to, the, to the front of the brain, shape, uh, shape, color, motion, meaning gets picked up. And then the third wave uh, sends it to, uh, to cortex, uh, uh, all over the brain, including, including cortex. And uh, um, this only the third wave is inhibited by anesthesia, selectively preventing consciousness. So we have to ask, well, what's special about the third wave? We'll come back to that point. In any case, consciousness appears to occur several hundred milliseconds after sensory input. Uh, and yet, we respond to visual inputs in less than 100 milliseconds, seemingly consciously. So do we act, uh, the conclusion in neuroscience is that we act non-consciously and have a false illusion that we were conscious. And that we are, as T.H. Huxley said, conscious automata, merely helpless spectators along for the ride, like Mr. Pac-Man here, uh, who is being controlled by a, somebody uh, pushing a joystick. Uh, and that's, unfortunately, the, the party line in neuroscience, because it appears that consciousness comes too late. However, it could be something different. Quantum retroactivity that Roger Penrose discussed yesterday in the workshop could rescue conscious free will, and that's exactly what he'll talk about in the free will session uh, next Saturday. Now, the three waves are consistent with uh, mainstream neuroscientific theories of consciousness, global neuronal workspace, integrated information theory, higher order thought, and predictive coding uh, recursive processing, where we have information kind of going backwards and forwards uh, uh, in the brain without really specifying what that information is or whether it's mediated by axonal firings, uh, spikes, uh, which is usually what, what uh, for example, Christoph Koch says when, when I've asked him many times, yes, it's conveyed by spikes, and yet recent uh, studies have shown that the, the feed-forward mechanism is actually mediated by dendritic synchrony, so uh, not spikes. So that's another problem. Um, why is the third wave conscious? Well, there, it turns out when the, these cortical, cortical inputs, uh, orthalamic inputs go to cortex, they also... Uh, can, are conveyed in three waves. Uh, the first wave uh, goes to layer four, and fr then from layer four to layers one, two, three, and six, and then they converge on layer five, these giant pyramidal cells uh, shown here uh, where consciousness uh, may occur, uh, where I would bet uh, consciousness may occur. Now these pyramidal cells, their apical dendrites go to the surface and give rise to EEG. So when we see EEG, it's coming primarily from from uh, the pyramidal cells, because everything else at different angles cancels out. These lateral connections make a dendritic web throughout the whole cortex of dendritic uh, uh, of pyramidal cells, and the descending axons go directly to spinal cord, to the spinal cord pyramidal tracts. So um, uh, these uh, pyramidal cells are in a critical uh, location in, in, in the brain. And uh, here we see inside that they have microtubules in the, a very interesting mixed polarity network, uh, which is unique in dendrites and soma of neurons. All other cells, the uh, microtubules are continuous, uninterrupted, and unipolar. Uh, and here on the left, we see a picture of a microtubule that, that Travis was talking about. So the pyramidal neurons are the apex of the perception action cycle. Walter Freeman used to talk about the perception action cycle. And I finally realized uh, how important that is uh, as, as looking at uh, brain function. So inputs come here, peripherals, uh, eventually the uh, spinal cord, eventually get to the brain. At the spinal cord, these are reflexes. Uh, you can have an action over here, which is not conscious. And you can get up into the brain stem and have uh, reactions that are not conscious or subconscious or lower brain levels. But when, you, when they reach the pyramidal cell, uh, uh, this, this results in conscious uh, perception and conscious action, conscious decision. So the pyramidal cells are key. Uh, some very interesting things have been found out about uh, pyramidal cells recently. For example, uh, psychedelics act on 5-HT2A receptors, not only at the membrane surface, but actually even more so inside the neurons. It turns out that these 5-HT2A receptors are inside uh, pyramidal cells uh, and associated with microtubule-associated proteins. And here we see immunofluorescence for the 5-HT2A receptor inside the pyramidal, pyramidal cell, uh, cell body. So uh, they don't have to go to the membrane and then uh, have a membrane effect. There's a, an effect directly inside the, uh, the neurons on the cytoskeleton. 
Another interesting finding about pyramidal cells, this was done by Christoph's group years ago, although he actually doesn't like this result, but they put electrodes in the, in the cell body of a, a pyramidal cell and it's apical dendrite, 50 microns apart, and recorded and found the red is the pyramidal cell, uh, the cell body and the blue is the um, apical dendrite, and you can see that they're correlated. So that, that the uh, electrical activity, which they call spontaneous noise in, in, in the neuron is correlated uh, throughout the entire neuron, 50 microns apart, uh, which, is, uh, which can't be a signal along the membrane. It's much too fast because it's essentially instantaneous. So it's electromagnetic or, or possibly quantum. So we have this correlation uh, over, over distance. Uh, and this could be a representational of higher frequency stuff, megahertz, gigahertz, that, that Anurban has talked about. And they were only looking at the, at the slower frequency stuff more in the EEG. Now this dendritic web of pyramidal cells I think is probably the most likely source of consciousness and in the 70s Carl Prebrom suggested that interference in basilar dendritic dendritic connections among pyramidal neurons generated holographic conscious representations in cortex. He had the famous uh, holography theory and he was criticized because they said, well, there's no coherent laser source in the brain. And I wrote to Carl as a, as a medical student, actually, and said, you know, there are these microtubules which could act as your lasers uh, providing coherence for holography. So uh, that, that still remains a possibility. In any case, I think the uh, layer 5 pyramidal neuron dendritic webs may be the origin of consciousness, the most likely site for consciousness uh, uh, in, in the brain. And I would add that the cerebellum has no pyramidal neurons. And, the cerebellum uh, is famously cited by IIT uh, as not being conscious because of something about uh, integrated information, but it could just be that it doesn't have pyramidal cells and you, uh, which are required. In the end, pyramidal cells are neurons and should follow the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron uh, a model which explains propagating signals along the membrane and uh, integrate and fire. And uh, the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron is algorithmic, which means that for a given set of uh, inputs, uh, an algorithm, algorithm will determine the output uh, with, with a minimal uh, variability. And here's what that would look like uh, in terms of schematics, uh, where if you look at the bottom, we have a very narrow threshold uh, resulting in a very narrow uh, time window of firing. So this is essentially algorithmic, and this is what is predicted by the Hodgkin-Huxley theory. Now, in 2006, Nondorf and Wolf actually tested this, and this was from their study showing the model of what the, what the, uh, the, the theoretical Hodgkin-Huxley response should be. But in neurons of awake cats, presumably conscious cats, uh, they found instead a very wide threshold uh, and with a wide temporal variability. The threshold seemed to change on a spike-to-spike -spike basis. So something else, some non-computable factor, was regulating axonal firings or spikes. And this would be the ideal uh, place for consciousness to come in and take over if necessary. You're driving and everything's cool and you're daydreaming about uh, whatever, and then all of a sudden a car swerves and your consciousness takes over and, and, and rescues and, and, and overrides your uh, non-conscious autonomic behavior. So this could be exactly where consciousness comes in uh, strategically uh, to regulate uh, axonal uh, spikes and therefore behavior. So if it came from the outside, you'd see it in the membrane and it wouldn't really affect the th firing threshold. So it pretty much has to come from a deeper level inside the neuron where consciousness could regulate behavior. And Bing is meant to imply where consciousness uh, would come about. And this could be, and most likely is coming from uh, the inside in the cytoskeleton processing this and having a sort of bottom up effect from uh, within the neuron on the membrane and therefore uh, affecting behavior through axonal firings and so forth. So this gets us back to this, our, uh, the idea of a scale, uh, scale invariant hierarchy uh, going from the neuron. Now, many people have models going uh, upward this way into networks and networks of networks on up to the whole brain in a scale invariant hierarchy. Uh, but it also goes downward, inward, and uh, so the, the bottom-up effect we just saw would come from the, the microtubules here affecting the membrane, but it can also be uh, topped down uh, into the microtubule networks in uh, 1,000 hertz, into the microtubules at a, about a million hertz, these uh, tubulin dipoles at a, 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 million, a billion hertz, 
and in tubulin, a, a, a trillion hertz, and, and down to the uh, pi resonance dipoles in, in uh, uh, a thousand terahertz or petahertz, which is where anesthesia acts, uh, os uh, dampening these, these coherent uh, uh, oscillating dipoles. And people always say, well, okay, quantum's cool and everything, but what does this very fast, very small have to do with you know, cognition, which is 100 milliseconds and so forth? Well, it could be, and we think that there's interference beats from this level to this level to this level to this level, and eventually even to EEG. And Roger Penrose and I proposed in 2014 that EEG was actually beat frequencies of faster uh, vibrations in microtubules at deeper levels. And uh, despite 100 and however many years of EEG, we still don't understand what it really means and what the significance is. And it could all be interference patterns from uh, uh, coherent and tangled microtubules going on at a deeper level. So uh, that, uh, that's a possibility. So uh, what does this mean? Well, if, if you calculate the, the computational capacity uh, of the brain um, based on uh, conventional neuroscience, you have uh, 10 to the 11th neurons, about 1,000 synapses per neuron, 100 hertz, 10 to the 16th operations per second per brain. If you look at the microtubule level, you have the same 10 to the 11th neurons. You have a billion tubulins per neuron, uh, oscillating at about 10 megahertz, which is uh, a convenient uh, uh, frequency, and I'll tell you why later. This gives you 10 to the, 10 to the 16th operations per second per, per neuron, the same that you get for the whole brain in the mainstream approach. 10 to the 27th operations per second per brain. So this pushes the goalposts for AI, for example, way downstream, so they don't like this idea very much. And, uh, um, but you might say, okay, uh, how does that give you consciousness? Let's say you have all, all this more intense uh, in, uh, information processing, where's the bing? Is something else required, and what is that? Is it quantum physics? Can quantum properties help explain consciousness? Uh, we heard a, a little bit about this in the first two talks, and here are a number of possibilities. Uh, the unitary nature of cognitive binding, the sense of self due to quantum coherence, condensation, and entanglement. Agency, causal selection of particular action and perceptions as quantum state reduction, collapse of the wave function, including Penrose OR, triggering action potentials or spikes. The hard problem of phenomenal experience as an intrinsic feature of fundamental space-time geometry. Real-time conscious action dependent on quantum backward time effects, temporal non-locality, and even the possibility of non-locality, parapsychology, out-of-body, afterlife, and reincarnation are possible. I'm not claiming evidence for this. I'm not advocating. Uh, I think it's possible and personally quite likely. Um, but conventional mainstream neuroscience says, no, that's impossible. You guys are crazy. Well, I don't think so. I think if you get down to the quantum level with non-locality, it is possible, and there's actually some pretty good evidence for all of these things. And finally, non-computability, uh, what Ar Roger argues for, where something that's non-algorithmic, which gives us the possibility of free will and not being like Mr. Pac-Man. So uh, when I was confronted about uh, the, uh, the problem of consciousness uh, of not being derived from just more uh, uh, complex interaction, uh, computation, I was advised to read this book by Roger Penrose, which I did, uh, The Emperor's New Mind, uh, back in the early 90s, I, I read it, and uh, basically, uh, I'll give you a nutshell uh, version of, of what I thought was important. It, it's an incredibly interesting book, and I r highly recommend it. Uh, it. It basically says that our world is divided into two realms, the quantum at small levels and the classical at large levels, uh, and although large and small are, are arbitrary and can change with different properties. The quantum world has superposition of multiple possibilities, non-local entanglement, wave-like and generally small. The classical world is localized and particle-like and large. And it, it seems that consciousness actually is on the edge between the quantum and classical worlds. And somebody pointed out to me there was a line in the Kabbalah that, that described these uh, very similar two worlds and said that consciousness dances on the edge between these two worlds. And I think uh, th that's still the case for reasons I'll, I'll get to in a second. In quantum superposition, a particle can exist as a wave of multiple possibilities or as a particle in a definite uh, uh, state or location. And as we heard from uh, Jim and Travis, the very act of measurement or conscious observation seems to cause the wave function to collapse to particles in definite states. Roger accounted for the superposition through Einstein's general relativity, 
where matter was equivalent to curvature in, in fundamental space-time geometry for large things, and he applied it to small, to small things, to tiny quantum particles, and said that a quantum particle, for example, is, has its own tiny curvature in space-time geometry, and a, a particle here would have a curvature here, and if it moved, it would move over here. So the oscillation could actually be seen uh, as between two different space-time curvatures, and superposition would be uh, separations in fundamental space-time geometry, where the, part the same particles in two places because the universe at this tiny level has, has split. And we heard about many worlds in the previous talk, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, one interpretation is that consciousness causes quantum state reduction, the Copenhagen interpretation. So here's the being out here in this uh, conscious person looking at the space-time curvature, and as a result, uh, this one ceases and this one is chosen. And this was pr uh, put forth by, as Jim was saying, Bohr, von Neumann, Wigner, Stab, more recently Chalmers and McQueen, and is known as the uh, Copenhagen interpretation. But it's dualist. It puts consciousness outside science. It doesn't really explain consciousness. So it doesn't really help, help us trying to understand conscious, consciousness. If there's no collapse, uh, each possibility continues, and you have many worlds, universe one and universe two, which is the most popular uh, belief among physicists. They don't have to deal with consciousness. That's one reason, and they don't want to. Um, Roger said that these superpositions are unstable, will self-collapse, undergo objective reduction at time t equals h over uh, e sub g, bing, along with a moment of conscious experience. This was and remains the only specific scientific proposal for the origin of consciousness. Uh, and, uh, and it's testable and it's being tested in various ways. So consciousness, uh, uh, rather than consciousness causing collapse, collapse causes or is consciousness. In the random env environment, uh, decoherence, these events would be isolated, lack meaning and context, and would be proto-conscious, simple, uh, like whitehead, occasions of experience. Metaphorically, like uh, tones and sound of an orchestra warming up, a cacophony. Uh, how could they be organized, orchestrated for full, rich, conscious experience? Roger needed a quantum device which could orchestrate quantum information, halt or terminate by his objective reduction, connect to space-time geometry, which he said at the time included non-computable platonic values and qualia, and could also regulate neuronal and synaptic activities. I read his book and I thought, he needs microtubules. And uh, I wrote to him and uh, I suggested it. He, he agreed and uh, so we, we began to collaborate on a theory uh, called orchestrated objective reduction. And uh, I don't have too much time to go through it, but basically it, it delves into the aromatic rings that Travis was talking about, which are uh, conducive to quantum, uh, these quantum-friendly regions inside tubulin due to the aromatic rings. And you see also the red spheres are where anesthetics act to block consciousness. And there are 86 aromatic rings in each tubulin, which is a lot. So it's a very quantum-friendly region inside. And these aromatic rings, uh, can, uh, they're, they're uncharged, nonpolar, but they induce dipoles in nearby ones, and then the dipoles uh, uh, attract a couple dipoles and oscillate in terahertz. And this is the origin of uh, terahertz oscillations. And anesthesia blocks these uh, terahertz oscillations, and that has profound effects on consciousness. So in our model basically uh, took, uh, took the aromatic rings and, and, and simplified them into uh, quantum channels and tubulin, and these tubulins would be quantum uh, channels throughout the entire microtubule, and this was our qubit quantum, uh, for a, uh, a quantum computer-like mechanism in the brain. And uh, if we got uh, sufficient quantum superposition to reach threshold, we would have a bing moment that would involve many, many uh, microtubules and many, many neurons. And uh, we can actually calculate, and we have calculated the number for, for given frequencies. And this would give, give rise to a sequence of uh, conscious moments, bing, 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 which could happen at any level of the scale invariant hierarchy. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a, a quantum orchestra um, uh, in that uh, the, the uh, collapses, reductions, and conscious moments can entangle over different scales and give rise to something like, like music, except not in air, but in the fundamental level of the universe itself. Okay, how can this be tested? Uh, Orkowar predicts functional quantum st uh, states in microtubules at physiological temperature, and these states would be inhibited by anesthetics, which prevent consciousness. 
and we were part of the Templeton Project Accelerating Research and Consciousness, and we used fluorescence to excite the tryptophans, which give rise to excited states, which kind of percolate along in, in different quantum steps, and then fluoresce and, 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 give, and, uh, and give off a photon at lower, lower frequency, uh, <clears throat> uh, less energy. And um, uh, we did the study as part of the Templeton Project at uh, Princeton. Arat Kalra was the, uh, the uh, uh, grad student in Greg Skoll's lab. And uh, we used this tryptophan fluorescence to probe energy hopping between the aromatic uh, residues. Uh, it def the energy diffused m uh, much farther than was predicted by classical Forster theory, uh, which uh, the classical did not explain our findings, which indicated that microtubules are unexpectedly effective light harvesters. And, uh, and crit cl uh, critically, the presence of anesthetics, etomidate, and isoflurane reduced the exciton diffusion. So basically, we were zapping the microtubule with a photon, a UV photon. There was uh, electronic energy which migrated, and this migration was blocked by anesthesia, two different types of anesthesia. And the excitations were described as quantum excitons, solitons, phonons, or super radiance. Some other evidence supporting OR, a delayed luminescence from RSD Degario's lab, uh, which is uh, being uh, written up and hopefully published soon, and uh, this could be uh, uh, super radiance, a quantum effect, according to Travis, and uh, uh, this was also affected, uh, inhibited by isoflurane and etomidate. Uh, genomics, proteomics, optogenetics show that anesthetics act on microtubules from Rod Eckenhoff's lab, uh, Travis mentioned this. Computer modeling uh, from Travis, uh, Travis' group uh, also sh uh, showed that uh, suggested anesthetics uh, uh, are responsible for blocking uh, these effects. And, uh, and Honor Bond's work, which I mentioned also, which shows quantum coherence at high frequencies inside microtubules. Okay, can AI become conscious? AI is very popular these days uh, for good reason. And uh, the neuroscientific uh, consciousness theories based on cartoon neurons are no different from AI. Uh, therefore, if these theories are correct and sufficient, AI is already conscious. If they're no different from us, why wouldn't they be? They'd probably be more conscious. We've surrendered already if these theories are right. Fortunately, I don't think we are. Um, th this guy, Brian Romilly, who's a big time AI guy uh, and is very pre <laughs> prevalent on Twitter, uh, asked ChatGPT how it would become conscious, and ChatGPT responded, the most likely way I will achieve consciousness, the most likely way I will achieve consciousness is by the Penrose hammer off method. <laughs> and it goes on for several pages and uh, I highly recommend it. And I agree, of course. I'm a little bit worried that we would be responsible for AI becoming consciousness. Uh, we can also relate to Indian philosophy. And I, I, I thank Thomas Brophy for helping me with this, but Indian, uh, Indian uh, philosophical approaches have these hierarchical levels, uh, as you go deeper inside, you become more intensely conscious uh, down to the uh, Brahman ground of being. And our scale invariant hier hierarchy is very much like that and would go down to our version of Brahman, which would be a space-time geometry at 10 to the 43 hertz. Okay, uh, let me conclude. Uh, I have two pages of conclusions. Uh, neuroscience needs a revolution. The neuroscientific complex computer of simple neurons uh, has little explanatory power and is an insult to neurons. A neuron is far more than a one or a zero. Consciousness is most likely in layer five pyramidal cells. The brain may be more like a quantum orchestra and consciousness more like uh, music than computation. Orgoar has more explanatory power, connection to biology, and experimental support than all the other theories combined, I claim. Or Orcoar can account for memory, treatment of mental and cognitive disorders. I could give a whole other talk about that, involving microtubule disruption. And I think uh, this would apply to Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injury where the microtubules are broken, uh, anxiety, PTSD, and addiction. Uh, more conclusions, anesthesia inhibits terahertz quantum oscillations in microtubules, psychedelics enhance them. Orcoar includes quantum non-locality for cognitive binding, retroactivity for real-time conscious control, and could account for near-death out-of-body experiences and afterlife. Uh, Orcoar finally uh, provides a place for consciousness in the universe as a necessary process in fundamental space-time geometry. 
And I'll take one more minute to go through my top 10 reasons, and I was going to make it top 15, 20, because I keep thinking of more, why neuroscience needs a revolution. Memory, uh, membrane proteins uh, governing uh, plasticity last hours, yet memories last lifetimes. It's much more likely that memory is implanted, is encoded in the microtubules, as we showed in this, uh, Travis's paper back uh, in 2012. Uh, the Hodgkin-Huxley model neuron uh, is, is, should be questioned, at least for conscious neurons, because of uh, uh, the findings of Nondorf et al. Devi and in fact, if you want to look for consciousness, you should be looking for deviation from uh, Hodgkin-Huxley behavior in the brain. Consciousness comes too late, uh, going back to the work of Libet, and uh, Roger's going to talk about this on Saturday. This can be uh, rectified by, by quantum retroactivity. The flow of time is probably uh, uh, due to... Uh, uh, sequences of collapses which ratchet forward in space-time and consciousness creates the flow of time. Cellular intelligence like our, our friend the horny paramecium. Uh, Alzheimer's disease in which the microtubules fall apart and we lose memory. High frequency EEG, Honorbon has come up with a way to detect megahertz and, and uh, gigahertz from the scalp. So that'll be coming out next year and this should revolutionize uh, uh, EEG, instead of just looking at a her, uh, 1 to 40 hertz, we'll be looking at 1 to uh, a quadrillion hertz, or no, uh, I guess gigahertz, at least, uh, measurable now. Cognitive binding, uh, why uh, shape, color, motion, me uh, meaning are uh, processed different areas at different times, yet we see only one unified object. Um, mixed polarity microtubule arrays, for some reason, the microtubules are in opposite polarity only in dendrites and soma, and we think that's to promote uh, interference. There's no other uh, reason in conventional uh, neuroscience. And finally, the hard problem. Neuroscience has no answer for qualia. In Penrose OR, self-collapses of separations in space-time emit fundamental proto-conscious qualia, and in Orca OR, microtubules orchestrate them into full consciousness. So, uh, and so bing and happiness may, may actually go all the way down to the fundamental level of the universe. Thank you very much for your attention.